you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask that you turn to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 14, and we're going to begin reading in verse 22. 1 Kings chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. The Bible says, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed above all their father their fathers had done. And they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house he even took away all and he took away all the shields of gold made by Solomon that which Solomon had made and King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them unto the hands of the chief guard, which kept the door of the king's house. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard, and that the guard bare them and brought them back into the guard chamber. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you and praise you for meeting with us. We give you the glory for that. Lord, we pray for each and every one that is before us today, Lord, that you would make your word a real word to them today, Lord, that you'd make it true, that you'd make it known unto them, and that you'd liven them up with it. Lord, we pray that you would remember, help us to remember uh, where, uh, where our source comes from, Lord. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, this morning we're going to be preaching on treasures. And uh, very often the first, uh, first thought is, well, I don't have any treasures. I, I don't have anything of real value, but you do. Uh, you can be homeless and still have treasures. Uh, you, can be, uh, uh, you can be without food and, and still have treasures uh, that are yet to come. Uh, verse 22 starts, and Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, uh, I, I think it's very interesting, and sometimes we just skim over that and don't realize it, but just remember that the Lord recognizes your evil and your good on a daily basis. And that should make us a little bit upset and a little bit concerned because I know you're like me and I'm like you that there's probably lots of days there's more evil than good. So uh, I want you to see that the Lord is taking note of that. And certainly if He is, uh, we should as well and understand uh, where we stand at with Him. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord and they provoked Him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed. Now, I want you to see that that seems a little strange and, and you're like, well, how is he jealous of sin? Well, you're worshiping that more than you're worshiping him. You're, you're, you're involved in sin and giving your zeal to sin, which where it should be placed in the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we take away time for Christ and give it to something else, he gets jealous. He gets upset. He, he, he says, that ought to be mine. And the same thing in go of your tithes and your offers, offerings and, and everything that you can think of, other people are getting it. That's why it never ceases to amaze me why God's people can't give them the time He deserves. Yeah. You know what? If I don't show up for work, I don't get paid, right? Same thing ought to go for the Lord's service. And so we, we see that as well. The rest of that verse says, Above all their fathers had done. Now, I want you to see he makes a reference back in time to when uh, the abomination of their fathers. Now, that's not like 
James Lafferty is my father, but rather it goes back generation after generation to the very ones that they brought them down out of Egypt. You know what? Those people were a wicked people. Uh, you know, God delivered, you know, and I really believe this, and uh, I think there's some Bible for it, that I believe the only redeemed that came out of, uh, that came out of Egypt was Moses, Caleb, and, ja and, and Jacob. That, that's it. I, I don't think any of the rest were redeemed because they didn't act like, you know what? Redeemed people act like redeemed people. And you know uh, what Paul says, they do the things that are contained in the law and they don't even know what the law says. You know what? That, that shows that works naturally accompany redemption. And so if we believe that, and I do, we have to believe the flip side. If there's not any works there, why should we be convinced that they're redeemed to start with? See, you know, when you read James, everybody, you know, uh, I've even heard uh, that su suggests that James isn't even canonized. That means that it's not even uh, really ought to be a part of the King James Bible. And the reason people have an issue with James is this. It's all about works. And you know what? Generally, as a people, we don't like works. But you know what? According to James... <laughs> That's your best self-evaluation. What about your works? And so then we as the Lord's people ought to have an interest in doing that. So I want you to see that they were acting like the lost. Verse 23. And they also built them high places. Now high places is type of a pulpit. You know, uh, during the days of repentance that would come later on in, in, in uh, books such as Ezra and, uh, and uh, Nehemiah that they built them a pulpit. That's what they called it. It was a high place that was up and that they could be seen reading the Word of God which they had discovered down at the temple. Well, this is the very same premise. They built them a high place but the preaching wasn't no good. You know what? We live in a lot of day, days where there's a lot of pulpits across this land, but the preaching ain't no good. Yeah. You can go just a short distance down 79 Highway toward Clarksville, you can see a lot of church buildings that have some pulpits, but the preaching ain't no good. Yeah. See, uh, that, that, that was the purpose of this. It was a type of idolatry that they were worshiping and listening and hearing other things preach besides the truth. And they built them high places and images. You know what? We have no, no idea, no, no, uh, no uh, reason whatsoever to, to embrace an image of God or embrace an image of Christ or embrace the image of an angelic being. You know why? Because that's idolatry. That is idolatry. You know what? You go into a lot of so-called even Baptist churches and they have the stained glass windows. You know what they are? They're images. And you know what? You said, little children, keep yourself from idols. Keep yourself from images is what exactly it says. And, and you know what? We don't know what Christ looked like. That's the simple truth. Now, I'll say this, and the older I get, the more I see this, uh, uh, predicting His coming in Psalms 22, the Bible says this, he was, uh, uh, He's without form or comeliness. In other words, He was not a good-looking man. man. Uh, but then, huh, the revived image, they didn't even know it. Because he was, he was showing Himself as the Son of God. And, and, and at that point, he probably was a specimen among specimen uh, of, what, uh, of what a man is, is supposed to look like. And so we see then that they were into what things looked like. And groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there's your uh, worship. You know what? Spring is a long time coming this year. And you know over there in the, in the neighbor's yard over there you see a cedar tree. It's greener than the oaks beside it because it's an evergreen tree. And, and they like that because they considered it life. And so they, they, they began to worship it. <laughs> You know, you know what it is? That's where Jeremiah warned them in Jeremiah 10 uh, verses 1 through 4. You stay away from that mess. 
And, and that's why uh, people who observe the Christ Mass drag all that junk into their home, and it's idolatry. Mm -hmm. Again and again and again they were warned about it. But they did it anyway. That was the day of Rehoboam. Now, let me interject this. Who was Rehoboam's daddy? Solomon, right? Somewhere along the way, Solomon wasn't doing his main job, and that was to train up those children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And you say, well, that's judging. No, it's comparing Bible to Bible, because the Bible promises this. You train up them children in the way that they should go, and when they are old or mature, they will not depart from it. You know what? Rehoboam departed. And if you follow the life of Solomon, you know what? Solomon did too. <laughs> what does it say? And when he was old, <laughs> the wives that he had married turned his heart. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, and so, you know what? Uh, we get down on Rehoboam, but I believe Rehoboam was a product of his raising. Every time he turned around, Solomon was taking another wife, another concubine. You know what? When you have 900 wives, you ain't got a lot of time to spend at home, do you? And, and so we see then that uh, really Rehoboam was, was, was the result of Solomon's neglect. You know what? When we think of neglect, we think about children going hungry and stuff like that. You know what? If you're not doing your job and you're not down there to direct those children and make those children behave, fathers, you've neglected them. I don't care how much you give them. I don't care what kind of food you give them, what kind of vehicle you bought them. If you're not there to be their director, you have neglected them. So... We find Rehoboam was a neglected child. He'd never been taught. And you know what? You know how people that have never been taught are going to act? They're going to act like heathens. Because they've never been taught. Right? And, and so we find really that Rehoboam was just a product of his raising. And he took it that much further than his daddy did. <laughs> Verse 24. And there were also Sodomites in the land. Now that seems almost out of context, but you know what he's describing in verse 23? He's describing an idolatrous generation, a generation that is worshiping the created more than the creator, and, and part of that is Sodomites. Now, if we've ever lived in a day-to-day, -day, that is the day in which we live, and, and, and it really started long ago when we started uh, worshiping things. You know what? You, you study that word God. Have we ever been guaranteed a home in this present life? Now, there's not a one of us grown people in here that doesn't own our own home. You know what? You weren't promised that. Everybody knows I like genealogy. And I, I've studied my great great grand. Mother, she married brothers. I've told you that. She married one of them, then he died, and she married the other one. And all their lives, I can't tell that they ever owned anything. And the direct inclination of the flesh, first thing it blows up in it, will bless their hearts. Will bless their hearts what? Now, the other flip side in the tragedy, you know what? The best I can understand, they never attended church. Maybe, maybe my great-grandmother, uh, great-great-grandmother attended a Methodist church, but those two men, the best of my understanding, they never entered the house of God. You know what? That's a lot more sad than living in rent shacks the entirety of your life, is it not? That, that, that's a lot more pitiful to think about. Not that they never owned anything, but the very fact that they did not recognize the Creator of all things. And so we find then, as the Lord's people, that idolatry and worshiping things always is with, you have this sodomy come out 
in, in that society. And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Now, remember the casting out when they were to cleanse the land was never complete. Remember? The, the, one of the very first tribes they came in on to, they, they took them in for slaves, remember? And they were not supposed to do that. They were supposed to kill them. Now, in our mind, that's a gross relation. And, and we can't imagine why the mighty God of heaven, their, their instruction was to kill every one of them, even the women and the children. That's what, that was the annihilation of the land. And, and, and you, know, you, know, we, you know, that's cruel. No, it was God's plan. So, with that said, sometimes our affection is misplaced. Where we should just obey the Word of God. Right? And, and so we find then, because they would not do this, what happened after a number of generations, those, the, those heathens that they allowed to live began to influence them and teach them that sodomy is okay. That, that men with men is alright and women with women. Hey, there's no problem with it. And, and so we live in a day that has repeated that and a lot of it is out of our wealth as a nation. You know, uh, if you had to work all day just to eat, then, uh, then you wouldn't have time to think about anything else, would you? And, and so then we see that that was the result of their lifestyle. Verse 25, and it came to pass in the fifth year. Now, uh, you write that down in the fifth year. Because 95% of the time in the Bible, five stands for grace. But I want you to see this morning that this time five stood for judgment. Because Egypt came in and annihilated the nation. The fifth, in the fifth year. See, this is the truth of this. The Lord is only going to take that for so long. Now, if you're really His, now let me say this. If you can sin and wall around and muck and it never seems to bother you, probably you're still lost. But see, the prodigal, eventually he had enough of laying down and wallowing with the hogs, did he not? Eventually he had a gut full of corn husks and wanted to go back to his father's house. You know what? That's a good, good sign of redemption. These people were never repented. So God took care of the problem. And if you never repent of your sin, this is the truth. God takes care of that problem as well. Uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily like to see that, but that's exactly what happens. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of, of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord. Now, I want you to see uh, it, it, what, what mattered to the world was the gold. And, and listen, just think about how the temple was put together. There were so many that was overladen with gold and overladen with brass and silver hooks to hang the curtains on. And it was, a, it was an incredible place. And God uh, uh, took Egypt and came in and take, take, took every bit of it. So what you think you don't have, God can take. And you know what? <laughs> most of them, most of them would have been upset when they went down into the temple. Now if you came in here next Sunday and all the windows were broken out and there was graffiti all over the walls and new light bulbs were all broken, you know what? It ought to horrify us. But it did not these people. See, you can get in such a state where the results of sin, I didn't say sin, but the results of sin, never it doesn't mean anything to you anymore. It's not troubling. It's not upsetting. And you know what? As a nation, have we not arrived at that? The killing of literally millions of babies 
Don't prompt us to go down to the hood in Nashville and pick at the abortion clinic. You know what we label people like that in our mind? Let's be honest, we think they're freaks, don't we? And you know why? Because we're no longer horrified by sin. If we stand in truth against sodomy, we're, 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 we're labeled as a bigot. You know what? We just need to be honest. And, and so, what, what was Rehoboam's idea? Alright? We're just going to put brass back in its place. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and even took away all. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them unto the hands of the chief of the guard and kept the door of the king's house also. So his idea and the idea that's out there today is give them a close facsimile. Uh, we can no longer, uh, if, you, if you can no longer uh, be met with by the Lord, if the Holy Ghost doesn't come down, let's pretend that He does. Let's put some wild lights in the building and do some strobe stuff. And see what that is? It's the brazen shields. They're not as good as gold. You know what we need today? We need the gold. I don't care if it's just two or three of us meeting. I don't care where everybody's at. I'm sick of brass, ain't you? I'm sick of the fat simile. I'm sick of, I'm sick of pretending there's something there when there's not. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we ought to pray go. So what you need to do this morning is ask yourself, what is your treasure? See, uh... A lot of times, we don't even want to acknowledge when the treasure's missing. Reboam didn't, did he? We just replace it. You know what? When I don't hear from the Lord for a long, long time, you know what I need to do? I need to confess that thing because the treasure is missing. But you don't, you don't see that today. You know what? Instead... <laughs> You just go along and pretend. Right. Put a little brass on, shine it up real bright, and maybe people will think that it's gold. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, we ought not to do that, but rather we need to look at the treasures that we have and see if there's anything noteworthy uh, in, in, involved in that. Verse 28, And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord, that the guard bare them and brought them back into the guard chamber. Now I want you to see this. There's idolatry on the hills. There's sodomites all around them. And, and, and Rehoboam is still going to the house of God. So don't think just because you attend church that you're in the will of God. Right. You see what I'm saying? Rehoboam... You know what? Rehoboam didn't miss, miss a Sabbath. It was the biggest idolater that's ever been. And, in other words, that could happen to us. And the reason why is Rehoboam did not treasure the things of God. Not in the very least. He didn't tre treasure a relationship with God. He didn't treasure uh, uh, being near unto the Lord. He just had no... His treasures were elsewhere. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 6 and we're going to read a very brief portion from the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord Jesus Christ, most lengthy sermon. And He did it uh, in, in a wonderful way and brought out unbelievable in that amount of points. Uh, Matthew uh, 6 verse 19. Lay up not yourself treasures upon the earth. Right. Now, does that say you cannot own a home? No. But don't you treasure it. There you go. You see what I'm saying? Because you know what? <laughs> For me, don't get back out to the hill. That old double, double wide could be burnt to the ground. See what I'm saying? And you know what? It would upset us, but I, I really, and maybe it's a thing that comes with age. I think it is. 
But you know what I'd really be upset about? Uh, the pictures of my children. Because you know what? They can't be replaced. That Amish old table, we can get us another one. But I can't bring those things back. Uh, so where where is your treasure? Uh, is the things you have provisions of God or are they treasures? And that all depends on how you look at it and, and, and what they mean in your life. You know, we, un, we need to understand and know that this world is not our treasure. Lay not up yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doeth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Now, what about when thieves break through and steal? Now, uh, me and Donna's house has been broken into two or three times. And on various occasions took different denominations of money. Uh, you know what? Let the money... You, you know what bothered me about that? First of all, it's supposed to be a friend of mine that did it. But what really brought, brought bothered me is I felt a little vulnerable. That's my house. That's where I conk out at night and don't know that I'm in the world. I'm a hard sleeper once I finally get there. Make me feel vulnerable. What if I'm sleeping and I don't hear somebody get in here? My girls are on the other end of the house. You see what I'm saying? But as far as the few hundred dollars that was taken, let him have it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? What is your treasure? That, that money was unimportant. What is your treasure? Well, what is your emphasis? What, what do you like? Verse 20, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven. So we find a, we find a delineation there, there between treasures here and treasures in glory. Treasures in the world to come. But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doeth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. Now, do you see the difference there? In other words, heavenly treasures are safe. You know what? Nobody is going to take anything that belongs to you in heaven. Now, the problem is, I dare say, the majority of modern day believers don't have it. We need to focus on building treasure in heaven. Do you agree with me? That 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 will be our push. You know what? That, that's one result of Armenian doctrine that most people don't get. Is because, see, if all you have to do is say a little prayer and be safe and saved and safe and home free, why does the other matter to start with? But when you know that salvation is a precious gift that He did not have to give to you, you know what? It will motivate you to serve Him. It will drive you to, to serving Him for His goodness. And the other doesn't. You see what I'm saying? So where is your treasure at this morning? What, what is your emphasis? Where, where do you collect your gold this morning? But lay up yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doeth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So another measure of your treasure is what drives you. What do you think about? What do you enjoy doing? You know what? I appreciate my job. I, I enjoy my job generally, but I always have to place it back into this. You know why I have to get out and work? It was a curse from my Adam. Right. And I inherited it. I don't care how much I like my job. You know what? It'd be nice to sleep to 9 or 10 one day. You see what I'm saying? And so, why would I treasure that? You see what I'm saying? 
Why would I possibly treasure that? But you know what? We have people that spent their lifetimes on nothing more than a career. That, that'll want to be under God's people because you know what? Every one of those individuals, and it might be a good career, but every one of those individuals are pushing up daisies now. And, and after their children get through fighting over what little bit they have, you know what? It's gone. And what has been the meaning of their life? You know what? We need as the Lord's people to really evaluate what what is your life going to mean when you're gone? Yeah. Uh, what's been the value of it? And, and so identify your treasures this morning. Look at them. And that way you maybe know where you stand out stand at spiritually. Matthew chapter 12, just a, a little further over. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35. The Bible says this, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure, uh, out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. You know what? Uh, you can have a good treasure in your heart. That is the soul of man. That is the inward man. That is the redeemed part of man. You know what? You can have a treasure there and, and it, it will put forth out. It brings forth out. And, and, and you know what? An evil treasure. And I do want you to see the wording there. An evil treasure. You know what? Sometimes monetarily... An evil treasure is worth a whole lot more than a good treasure. Financially speaking, right? If you agree to work on the Lord's day because you're going to get double, triple time, you know what? That's treasure, but it's an evil treasure. You see what I'm saying? And so then we as the Lord's people... We need to evaluate very carefully what do you treasure. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said a little further in His ministry to hate thy mother and thy father and to hate thy children. And the reason why, if they're not promoting a godly life, you know what they're doing? They're robbing your treasure. They're taking part of it. It's not in there anymore. And, and so I ask you this morning, uh, the, the, the majority of the people you know, are they promoting a Christian uh, lifestyle? Are they promoting uh, heavenly treasure? Or rather, are they robbing you of heavenly treasure? Which does it stand for? Uh, Matthew chapter 13, just a little further over. Matthew 13 and verse 45. Matthew 13 and verse 45. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, I want you to see another thing in addition to real godly gold that needs to be in your treasure is the pearl of great price. Uh, some people... Uh, attribute this to the Son of God, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Others attribute it to salvation. I, I personally think it is salvation. Uh, now, the portion of that about buying it is what, what are you willing to give up to serve the Lord? See, this man was willing to give it up all. He saw that this was such a priceless commodity that that was really all that was important. You know what? If we could come down to that as a people, the Lord would bless us greatly. If we could come down to that individually, that really salvation is all that matters, that's the pearl of great price, is it not? Because you would do, be willing to do anything. Now, in the modern day, Again, because of the love of Armenian teaching, salvation has been reduced to nothing but any more than what you ask for. I've had a gentleman ask you for 35 or 40 cents. But when somebody gives you something that you didn't even mention, that's the pearl of great price. 
What about you? Do you have that or do you have fake? Uh, now, I'm no jewelry person. Uh, Sarah has on pearls today and I can tell you for sure they're not the real deal. Uh, I couldn't tell that if I didn't know. I'm sure she purchased them and she doesn't have a whole lot of money. I may have. Sometimes I purchase things that I don't know about till later. Um, but either way, you know what? We can't afford real pearls. And a jeweler that knew what he was looking for could look at that and say, oh, <laughs> that's an imitation. And we live in a day of imitations. And you know what? This is the, this is the, the real deal. We live in a day of good imitations. You know what? I have more pair of bri uh, short britches almost over 30 years. Everybody, like, man, that's just godly. Woo -hoo. Well, you know what? Lost people can do the same thing. And what they have is a fake. Foul, vulgar language, cut it out of your life. That's wonderful. You ought to. But just because you don't swear like a slut sailor does not make you redeemed. You see what I'm saying? And I believe we live in a day and age where we've been slipped a real good fake. And sadly, many people don't know the difference. So I would that you had the pearl of great price this morning, that you understand it, that your salvation is a commodity that you did not get on your own, but rather came by the hand of God. Uh, First Peter uh, chapter number one, uh, verse six. First Peter, First uh, Peter chapter number one, and uh, verse six. The Bible says this. Uh, but let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that I'm sorry, I'm in James. First uh, Peter. First Peter chapter one and verse six. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, I want you to see this, that sometimes you need to be in a difficult situation. You need to be in hard times. You need to be, and not just, we immediately conjure up food and stuff like that when we think of hard times, don't we? Sometimes you need to be in a spiritual hard time where the preaching's dry and crumbly. That way when you get a good piece of good hot biscuit, spiritual mm -hmm. stuff, you'll enjoy it. You see what I'm saying? Amen. And, and, and so, uh, now these believers, they were getting the real deal. They were getting physical punishment. And you know what? We not experienced that yet. We may, you younger people, the generation behind me and my grandchildren that are here this morning, you know what? You'll probably live to see it and, and, and be under that persecution like the first century believers were. You probably will experience that in time to come. Just remember this verse that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth might be tried with fire, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So, a couple of things there. One, first one, no one likes to deal with. In other words, uh, if you fall flat on your face in the time of trial, it's a mockery to Christ. People don't like to think about that, do they? You know what? That's the problem. And you know what? If we believe in the perseverance of a saint, the long acting of a saint, the, the, the remaining faithful to Christ comes, and I fully believe that. If somebody snaps at the last moment, I don't know. Hard to believe, hard to align that with Scripture, I'll say that, right? And what do we always do? Well, that's just the flesh for you. Well, if God is preserving you, how can you blame the flesh? You see what I'm saying? 
Uh, I think that's worth consideration, don't you? Number one, if nothing else, it'll make you depend on God when the time comes. Right? And, and so we find that we do need to go through this trial to prove not only to us, but to prove to others around us what we consist of. I want to have some spiritual gold this morning, don't you? I want some, I want some silver that's tried in fire. And for that to happen, I have to go through the difficult times. I have to go through the trying of my faith. Now, everybody wants to immediately jump in. Oh, I was sick. Well, you know what? I've been sick too. Who cares? The person is, the thing of this is, has your faith been tried? Got a couple of times in my life, and one of them does involve illness, not mine, but Adam's. Um, when he was really, really sick, and he was at Martin Hospital, um, they told us that they thought that he had meningitis. And he was so sick that he could not be moved. And you know what? For about a minute or two, I felt as alone as I'd ever been. And she was with me. I wasn't physically alone. But I felt about as alone as I've ever been. But then I remembered the God that I served. And that he was so much better than the regular here. And, and, and believe in, you know, uh, my God was able. Amen. See, uh, that, was a good, that was a good experience for me. Uh, I hated that my son had to be so sick for that to happen. But you see, the trying does have to come. You know what? You live long enough, you'll probably have the opportunity to deny him. Uh, what you need to think about now is if that's what you're going to do. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold which perisheth, though it be tried with fire, may be found in the praise and the to unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, I want you to see one last thing of this, and then we're going to read one more place and we're going to close. That faith is necessary. You know, it says, You haven't seen him, yet ye believe. Now, there are some holiness groups out there who will say, well, I've seen Christ. And I'll have to say, no, you haven't. Because he said to these believers, you haven't seen him yet, but you love him. You haven't seen him yet, but you have faith and confidence that he's able. See, that's precious. That's a treasure. And only people that have experienced that can identify with me. Other people will say, I wonder what he's talking about. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And so then we as the Lord's people, uh, we need that sometime to understand and know. Last place, Revelation chapter 3. Uh, nobody's favorite uh, series of Scripture. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, the church at Laodicea. Uh, Revelation 3 verse 18, the Bible says this, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire. Now what was wrong with the church at Laodicea? Were they still meeting? Yes. Kind of sounds like Rehoboam, don't it? They were still going down to God's house. In fact, of all the seven churches, it was the most wealthy, financially speaking. And it was the poorest, spiritually speaking. You see what I'm saying? Right. And, and, and so as they, they are getting involved here, he says, the remedy to your situation is to be tried. The remedy to your situation is to get some real gold. I counsel thee to buy of me. In other words, it's going to cost you something. If you want to be near unto the Lord this morning as an individual, it's going to cost you something. If you want to be near unto the Lord as a group of people, listen, church, it's going to cost us something. We may have to give up some so-called friends. But it is worth it forever. 
It, it is an eternal, wonderful thing. And so he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment and that thou mayest be clothed and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mightest see. The best, uh, the best container of eye salve you'll ever find is right here. Amen. But let me say this. You can't apply this yourself. You need the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. And He can make you see. He can, he can make you understand. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Now, how many of you heard that is an invitation to salvation? Every one of us. Maybe the younger generation have because you haven't been in many Armenian churches. But I have, haven't you? But who's he talking to? A church. What makes up churches? Saved folks. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. So he was talking to them. Listen, let me in. May I see you? Let us see you. Where you at? I'll come in. And, and you know what? That ought to be our desire is to meet with God. That, that ought to top everything else. And when he's beating on the door, let him in. If it takes 12.30 or if it takes to 1 p.m. or whatever time it might take, that it be such a precious commodity that we do it. Right. And that's exactly what they did. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You can measure yourself out. If you've not been chastened and you've not been rebuked when you're out in sin, probably... You're still lost. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, uh, uh, if any man hear me, hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, into him and sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcome, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Now, the last part is, is the clincher. To him that overcometh. Amen. You know what? <laughs> Best we know, Laodicea fell flat on its face. We, in fact, I think it's in Galatians, Laodicea is mentioned again. See, uh, you know what? I think Laodicea liked money more than they liked the commodity of the Spirit. We as the Lord's people need to understand and know whatever little bit of money that Christ has given this church here, it's for Him. It's, it's to be used for Him. You know what? We don't need it. I know of a church right now. Now, if I told you the city it was in, you would know it too. Brother told me just the other night, they can barely pay the light bill. And you think about how much more that we have. It only makes us ashamed, haven't it? Yeah. It, it? You know what? Again, through those trials that we you've learned about this morning, maybe it would do good, do New Testament good to take a special offering just to pay the light bill. You see what I'm saying? Maybe we have been blessed for too long. We get used to it, do we not? Right. We get accustomed to it. And we forget that, you know what, this money belongs to God anyway. Right? Yes, it is. And so, his, his last summation to the church at Laodicea was that you, what? You must be overcomers. Look what it says. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me at the throne. Huh. So we have to believe the flip side. If you're not an overcomer, if you are a person who caves in to pressure, probably you're just not saved. And if the overcomers are granted to sit there, we have to believe the ones who don't overcome are rejected, right? That's what I would have to come down to. So this morning I ask you, what's in your treasure box? 
What do you hold dear? What, what, what is precious to you? And you younger folks, my children, their wives, later something different is going to be a treasure for you. It'll take you about 50 years like me, but there'll be different things that replace what you have right now. The only thing that really, you know, I fully believe this. That's why Paul said it would have been better. The best ideal thing is that you remain unmarried. Not that, not that it's a burden or anything, but you know what? Even today, let me talk something about this this morning. It's not that we mind it, but you know, every day, one of the first things one of us has to do is to get up and assist Joey to get going. You see what I'm saying? Not that we mind it, but what if we, what if we could just get up and go? Be The Spirit spake to Peter and said, come over here and help us. There was nothing hindering him, was it? He got up and went.